Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus is that light of life. By the way, people, I have a blog on uh, one of Google's blogs. And uh, there is a lot of good information on the Noahide laws. If you're interested, I'll try to remember to post a link. Also, if you go to my homepage on YouTube, you'll see the uh, community page. And I've got it posted there, too. All right. Well, this is going to be part two of the bride, bride of Christ, Israel. And like I've mentioned in part one, uh, some people try to make the Bride of Christ and Israel and the church two different things. But uh, somebody pointed out in one of the comments today why they hated Paul was, well, the book of Galatians, specifically, specifically chapter 3, where it says we are all one in Christ. I, I don't know where they get this dual covenant thing, you know. Well, you know, Israel is one thing, and then the church is another thing. No, no. You're either in Christ or you're not. There is no Israel bride and a church bride, and, you know. Christ is not a bigamist or polygamist. Just not happening. But when I, sometimes when I start to do these studies, I, you know, I have an idea of an outline, and I've, I have a few ideas of where I want to go, but when I start studying these things, I just, it's amazing how everything ties in together. I mean, there is absolutely no way the Bible was written by unsaved men, just impossible. And, you know, let's face it, it was written over, oh, I don't know how many years, maybe over 2,000 years, I don't know, maybe 1,500, I don't know, by a number of different authors, uh, over 20 of them. I don't remember the exact numbers. You know, that's stuff I learned back a long time ago. But, uh, you know, they... It, was, it would have been impossible for them to conspire to put together something like this. So, all right, let's go to the book of Isaiah. We're going to go to chapter 61. Now, this is when Jesus started his ministry. This is where he went. <laughs> you know, I, I find it really interesting. Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. What captives? The captives in, um, uh, in hell. Abraham's bosom. I did a study on that. Really interesting. Rich man and Lazarus. And, you know, if you talk to Jehovah's Witnesses, they'll say, well, that's a parable. It's not real. So when the rich man was complaining about being in the flames of hell, that was just a parable, huh? Well, guess what? A parable is usually a, uh, an example of a real thing, you know? To proclaim liberty to the captives. And what happened when Christ raised from the dead? He took the, capti the captives in Abraham's bosom with him. Up into heaven where they're awaiting their resurrected bodies. To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. What prison? What prison? Well... You know, they want you to think, oh, well, that's the Roman prison. No, no. Adam, Eve, 
Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, they, Samson, they were all in the prison. Because of sin nature, they fell and they were separated from God. And we needed a sinless, perfect sacrifice to reconcile us back to God. And that's exactly what Christ is. He was a he was prophet, he was priest, and he's a king. He is our high priest. Read the book of Hebrews sometimes. Well, it helps to read the book of Le Leviticus in conjunction with the book of Hebrews. But, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's mind-boggling. God always follows his own laws. To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Boy, when that day of vengeance comes, look out for those that are unsaved. You know, the churches, well, I use that term loosely. Uh, actually, the great, great majority of places that call themselves churches are actually uh, tax exempt. IRS approved businesses with the name church in it. Yeah. And they'll never explain to you that judgment and wrath are two different things. They're not the same. Wrath is everlasting. Judgment is for a little while. You know, did you ever do anything wrong when you were little and your parents spanked you? Well, that's judgment. And uh, and I've been, I've had judgment from the Lord. I've been spanked. Oh yeah, I'm an expert. Trust me. In the book of First uh, Peter four seventeen, we read. For the time has come that judgment, judgment, must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Good question. All right. Back to Isaiah 61, verse 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Yes, people, we will be avenged. But until that day, we have to suffer. And let me tell you something. That's what the uh, tribulation period is all for about. It is to prepare the bride for her groom, for her husband. Right now, the, the people are just, you know, they like their cars, their SUVs, they like their house, their air conditioner, their microwave oven. I mean, I admit it. A hot bath? Oh, I love that. I love a hot bath. You know, but um, that's what it's all about. People don't realize it's to get rid of all the, the junk out of our lives. You know, bass boats. All right, so... To comfort all that mourn, verse 3, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and not morning, afternoon, and evening. No, sorrowful mourning. Oil 
of joy for mourning. Keep that in mind, because I wonder if that has anything to do with the, uh, remember the, the, the ten virgins, and five of them didn't have any oil? I don't know. Maybe it has something to do with it. Maybe it doesn't. Um, that's a story, I'll be honest, I'm not sure how that works. Because, you know, it tells them, well, go go and buy some oil. And I've heard people say, well, you know, the oil is the Holy Spirit. Well, how do you buy the Holy Spirit? You know? So the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness. And I think I did a study on trees. Because sometimes trees were things with green leaves with fruit on them. And other times trees were symbolic of family trees. That they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Read the parable of the wheat and the tares. There were things that the Lord planted, and then there were weeds that the wicked one planted. And you want to get kicked out of church, start talking about that in a Bible study. Oh yeah, they'll throw you out so fast. Well, I loosely call them a church. Actually, in a lot of ways, I have more respect for the Satanists. And not that I like them or admire them, I don't. But at least they're honest in what they believe. Whereas these churches, they're not honest about what they believe. They'll say one thing and they'll do another. Sort of like a politician's before election time. I, there are so few pastors that I have any respect for at all and you know uh david wilkerson i liked him arnold murray i liked him they're both gone i may not agree with everything they said but hey i'm not right about everything so what can i tell you verse four and they shall build the old ways. They shall raise up the former desolations. They shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. Yeah, there's going to be a come a time where there is restoration. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. For your shame ye shall have double, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land shall, uh, I'm sorry, therefore in their land they shall possess the double, Everlasting joy shall be unto them. For I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering. And I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. An everlasting covenant with them. Yeah. Now we're going to cover... Uh, we're going to mention that about covenant in a little bit. Verse 9. Isaiah 61, verse 9. And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them, that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. Wow, where do we read that? 
Let's take a look. How about Revelation chapter 6, verse 9? And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So here it is. These people had the word of God and the testimony of Christ, and they were killed for that. Verse 10, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Oh, wait a minute. But I've had people say, Well, you know, soul sleep, when you die, you don't know nothing. You're, you're dead, you're buried, and you know, you don't exist until the Lord raises you from the dead and you get a resurrected body. But here it is, it says, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, These people are dead with the body, but their souls are with the Lord. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy, holy and true, Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes, and white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Aha. Uh -huh. So... How does that work, right? So, you know, there are those that will, uh, well, let's take a look. Revelation 7, 9. After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues, stood before the throne, God's throne, and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Revelation seven thirteen and 14. And one of the elders answered, saying, uh, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Huh. Okay. Back to Isaiah 61, and verse uh, 10. I will great, really, greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be so joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decked herself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. Marriage supper of the Lamb, people. You know, the Old Testament is just full of types and shadows of what was to come in the New Testament. Verse 11. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Praise the Lord on that. Okay. All right, flip the page. Let's go to uh, Isaiah chapter 62. And I guess we'll read the whole thing. You know, when you think about it, the whole Bible is basically a love letter of the Lord to us. When you think about it, it is. It's a love letter. I mean, I, that gives me goosebumps. It really does. It gives me chills to even think about it. And people won't even bother to read it. 
people like Wycliffe were burned at the stake for the sin per the Catholic Church, the Vatican, the Pope, for the sin of translating the Bible into the common people's language. Yeah. I don't think I would want to be that person on at the white throne judgment on judgment day for them. I don't think I would want to be that person. And if I remember correctly, you know what you know what John Wycliffe said when the flames were burning his feet and his legs? He said, if I remember correctly, he said, Lord, open the eyes to the King of England. And not many years later, guess what? James, the King of England, sponsored the Bible, the authorized version, because it was authorized by the crown. Yeah. It is the number one most widely printed book of all times. And that's not to take anything away from the Geneva Bible. I, I don't care for the notes. Some of the notes are good. Some of the notes, eh. You know, the Geneva is, everything that I've ever read in it is okay, but I'll admit I haven't read the entire Geneva Bible. I did have a facsimile of it, but uh, I've lost everything. I've lost everything in my life a couple of times. And uh, I lost that, which really kind of hurts. It was my stupidity for, but then again, I was working two jobs, and uh, yeah, I wish I'd have, wish I'd have gotten that book. Don't have the money to get another one now, but I don't really need it. Everything in, I, I, I have no problem with the King James at all, none. So, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. And King uh, England went from being Catholic to uh, Christian. I won't say Protestant because I don't think, well, there, you know, back in Paul's day, yeah. Rome had a church in Paul's day. I don't know how long it was that it got corrupted, but it did. And there was a time when the majority of people living in the United States were believers. There was a time. But that didn't last very long. You want to read something really good? Read Jonathan Edwards' um, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Read that sometime. Boy, I tell you what, what a stirring speech. That was, well, sermon. People were crying out under conviction of the Holy Spirit. We need something like that today. But uh, what can I tell you? Isaiah 62, verse 1. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name. What is that new name? Huh. Are, called Israel? No. Are they called Israelis? No. Well, there is a group called Israelis, but uh, what is this new name? Huh. You know, in Antioch, they were first called Christians there. And, uh, yeah, think about that. And there's people who will tell you, oh, that's a bad name. Is it really? So, is it a bad name? Well, in, La in the book of Acts 11.26, 
And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Huh. 1 Peter 4.16. Nobody denies that 1 Peter is an inspired book of Scripture, except for maybe the Antichrist. Okay? We read, yet if any man suffer as a Israelite, no. As a Yeshuaite, no. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his on this behalf. Okay. Paul was taken before King Agrippa and was being tried for being a Christian. Acts 26, verse 26. Acts 26, 26. Paul saying, For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. You know, Paul's being tried for heresy for preaching Christ, okay? So Paul says, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and all together, such as I am, accept these bonds. Did Paul tell Agrippa, oh no, don't call us that name. That's a heathen satanic name. It's a curse being called a Christian. No, he didn't say that. He didn't say that. But the... Uh, there are those that will tell you that Christian is a horrible name. Isaiah 62, verse 2. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. All right, what's a diadem? Uh, in It's a noun. In the Greek, it meant to gird. In the Latin, to bind. Uh, it was like a headband worn by kings as a badge or royal, of royalty. Uh, tied around the temples and foreheads. Uh, in modern usage, it's a mark or badge of royalty worn on the head, a crown, and figuratively empire or supreme power. So, has reference to, you know, like a crown. Now, remember, when uh, in the trial of Jesus when they were getting ready to crucify him they put a crown of thorns on his head remember that in John 19 verse 2 and the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they put on him a purple robe uh, and yet for us we're we're capable of getting a crown 1 Corinthians 9.25 And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we are incorruptible. So, in 2 Timothy 4.8 Henceforth it is laid up for me a crown of a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, 
but unto all them also that love his appearing. Now, of Jesus in Hebrews 2.7 and, and, and Hebrews 2.9, Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownedest him with glory and honor and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Verse 9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Ah. James 1.12 Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. 1 Peter 5, 4, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Revelation 2, 10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. All right, Revelation 3.11. Behold, now this is Jesus, Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Oh, yeah. All right, so let's go back to Isaiah 62, verse 3. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephzibah, I got to look that up. All right, I ran into a dead end. Hephzibah, I don't know. That's the name of Manasseh's mother. Uh, Manasseh, uh, so I don't know. But thou shalt be called Hephzibah, and thy land Beulah, for the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee, and as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. I'm telling you people, the Bible's a love letter. It really, it is. Think about it. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence, and give him no rest till he uh, establish, until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Well, right now, Jerusalem is a harlot. It's not a praise in the earth. If you were a Palestinian, you sure as wouldn't be praising in the earth. A lot of Palestinians are Christians, people. A lot of them. I've heard between 15 and 25 percent, and they're being uh, they're not being treated very nice. Verse eight: The Lord hath sworn by His right hand, by the arm of His strength, surely I will. No more give thy corn to be meat for thine enemies, and the sons of the strangers shall not drink thy wine uh, for that which thou hast labored. Do you realize that Smithfield Hams, the largest pork producer in the world, was not so long ago purchased by the Chinese Communist government? What happens if there is a famine one day? 
Where do you think that food's going to go? You think they're going to, you think the food's going to go to uh, Kroger's and uh, Safeway and Aldi's and uh, Publix and uh, Albertsons? Piggly Wiggly? No. It's going to go to Peking, Beijing, Beijing, or whatever they call it, and Shanghai and uh, Huan or whatever it is. That's where that, that food's going to go. Well, I'm kind of glad. I don't eat that filth anyways, but I'm just saying. Surely I will no more give thy corn to be meat for thine enemies. And the sons of the stranger shall not drink thy wine for that which thou hast labored. But they that have gathered it shall eat it and praise the Lord. And they that have brought it together shall drink it in the courts of my holiness. Go through, go through the gates. Prepare ye the way of the people. Cast up, cast up the highway. Gather out the stones. Lift up a standard for the people. Do you know what a standard is? Um, it's sort of like a flag, a symbol. Uh, every tribe of Israel had a standard. If memory serves me correctly, Judah's standard was a lion, if I remember correctly. I could be wrong, you know, like that's never happened before, okay? Yeah. I'm being sarcastic there, people. Verse 11. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, this reward is with him, and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people. Wow, the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. What about this holy people stuff? Deuteronomy 7 and verse 6. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Deuteronomy 14.2 For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. Is there a New Testament witness? 1 Peter 2.9 But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Alright, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 3. Now, uh, Jeremiah, oh boy, it's kind of a depressing book. You know, the Lord wanted his people to love him and trust him and follow him. But of course, they didn't want to. No, no, we don't want to follow you. We want to, you know, uh, I think the uh, motto of the Church of Satan is best describes what the children of Israel wanted. The motto of the Church of Satan was, Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. In other words, do what you want to do. Make your own dreams come true. If it feels good, do it. That's basically... That's basically it. Ten Commandments? Eh, that's old-fashioned. Why follow that stuff, you know? Hey, I want to, you know, I want to do what I want to do. That's their motto. 
So Jeremiah was a prophet of judgment and wrath upon those that were wicked. So now there was a thing about in the Bible that a husband and a wife were bound to each other for as long as they lived. But if the husband died, the wife was free to remarry. Well, guess what? Israel's husband died. He was nailed to the cross. But then he was raised from the dead. So technically, he can remarry his wife that he divorced. Let's read it in Jeremiah 3. It's in verse 8, but we're going to read from verse 1. So turn to Jeremiah chapter 3, and we're going to go verse 1. They say, if a man put away his wife, divorce, and she go from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? So, you know, husband and wife, and they, you know, they get divorced, and then she takes off, and she goes, finds herself another guy. Um, is the first husband going to go back to her? That was a no-no. Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with, but thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, not just one, many. And what's a harlot? It's an old English word for whore. It's one of those king's English words. She, she's a little trop. She's a harlot. Tonight, it's a kind way of saying she's a whore. But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers. Yet return again to me, saith the Lord. See, even though his people were unfaithful to him, he longed for them to return to him. Verse 2, Lift up thine eyes unto the high places, and see where thou hast not been lion to. They always worship in the high places. You know, building this, that stairway to heaven. Oh, yeah. And, and they, they lay down figuratively, spiritually, with, those, with the devils, right? In the ways that thou, ha, uh, that thou sat for them, as the Arabian in the wilderness, and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms, and with thy wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withholden. It's talking about the rain, right? And there hath been no latter rain, and thou hadst a, full, a whore's forehead. Thou refusest to be ashamed. You know, there's no rain, there's no crops. Wilt thou not from this time cry unto me? My father, thou art the guide of my youth. Will he reserve his anger forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou couldst. And the Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, now, Josiah was probably the last good king of Israel. He had followed a procession of really evil, wicked kings. Well, I should, I should clarify that. He was the king of Judah. Israel and Judah were two separate kingdoms. Israel's capital was in Samaria. Judah's capital was in Jerusalem. And Josiah was the king of Judah. And Israel and Judah had a string of really bad kings. You ever heard of Ahab and Jezebel? Kings of Israel. The king of Israel and the, and the queen. 
Uh, I think her father's name was F. Baal, B-A-A-L, the name of the satanic god. Oh, boy. She was bad news. Ahab was bad, but Jezebel was even worse. I mean, she was, she was the ringleader. Even the things that Ahab didn't want to dabble in, she would, she would do double evil. She was, she was bad news. Let me tell you what, bad news. But, uh, but Josiah was a good king. And he tried to bring righteousness unto the land. The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? Israel, not Judah. Okay? Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. And I said after she had done all these things, Turn thou unto me. The Lord was longing for her, for Israel to return back to him, even after she had been unfaithful. And done horrible things and yet his arms were open still and they rejected the Lord and I said after she had done all these things turn thou unto me but she returned not and her treacherous sister Judah saw it oh yeah not only was Israel doing nasty stuff but Judah was watching it all. Verse 8. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, spiritual adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. The Lord divorced Israel. You will never hear this verse ever preached in John Hagee's church. I don't care if you went there for 30 years, you'd never hear this preached. Never. Never, never, never. Did I say never? Never. I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. All right, so God gave Israel a bill of divorce. He divorced Israel. And Judah was just as bad, but why didn't the Lord divorce Judah? Well, because God had made an everlasting covenant with David that somebody from his line would always rule upon the throne of Israel. And Christ is king, right? And of the line of David, right? Verse 9. And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. Can you imagine that? Made uh, idols of stone and worshipped them. Not the creator that made the stones, but the stones. Verse 10. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart. But feignedly, saith the Lord. Oh yeah, they would go, Judah would go and do their little temple sacrifice and their little fake worship in the temple. But it wasn't real. It wasn't 100%. It wasn't with their whole heart. You know, there's a lot of people that go to church just to be seen of other people. Yeah. I've met a lot of them. Well, I'm wrong. You don't go to church. You are the church. 
you might go to a building that calls itself the church, but it's not the church. The church is where two or three gather in the name of the Lord Jesus, who is the Christ. That's the church. Not a building. A building is not the church. You might get inside your car, but you're not the car. And you might gather inside a building, but the building is not the church. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly saith the Lord. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. God divorced Israel, but not Judah. But he says that Israel, whom he divorced, had justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Verse 12. Go and proclaim these words toward the north, and say, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful. For I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Listen to this carefully. Verse 13. Only acknowledge thine iniquity. What is iniquity? Sin. Doing things that God hates. That's iniquity. I'm an expert on that, too. Yeah. I'm an expert on that, sadly. God wants us to acknowledge our wickedness. Only acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Now, what does it mean, every green tree? Well, you know, that's the thing. The witches and Satanists would, um, they consider like the oak tree to be sacred. Matter of fact, I, and uh, the holly tree, huh, was supposed to be where they make their little magic wands out of. And, uh, you know, the witches ride on broomsticks and all that kind of stuff you know holly and um, oak they consider them sacred well to the satanists you ever wonder why they call hollywood hollywood ah just a coincidence i'm sure yeah they would do their little satanic sacrifices under um those kind of trees. And thou hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and will take you one of a city and two of a family, and will bring you to Zion. And I will give you pastors, pastors, you know, like ministers. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Boy, that doesn't sound like today, does it? And it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increased in the land in those days, saith the Lord. They shall say no more, The ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done any more. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. Well, that's going to be the day when the Lord returns in glory and sets up his kingdom in Jerusalem. Because it ain't today, people. Contrary to what the preterists, those that think that everything was fulfilled in 70 AD, they think Christ is ruling in Jerusalem. 
Boy, there sure is a lot of wickedness in Jerusalem for uh, the Lord to be ruling there. I'll tell you what. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. In those days, saith, uh, in, I'm sorry, in those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. And they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. What land is north? Europe. But I said, verse 19, but I said, How shall I put thee among the children and give thee a pleasant land, a goodly heritage of the hosts of nations? For I said, Thou shalt call me my father, and shalt not turn away from me. Surely as a wife treacherously departeth from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, say, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. A voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplications for the children of Israel, for they have perverted their way, and they have forgotten the Lord their God. Has anything changed since this was written? No. This is just as applicable today as it was back in the days of Jeremiah. Verse 22. Return, ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, we come unto thee for thou art the Lord our God. Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills. You're not going to find salvation in the hills. And from the multitude of mountains. No. You're not going to find salvation in the hills and not in the mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. For shame hath devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters, we lie down in our shame, and our confusion covereth us. For we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers from our youth, even unto this day, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. Now remember, in Jeremiah 3.8, the Lord said, He gave Israel a bill of divorce and put her away but in Jeremiah 31 and verse 31 what do we read behold the days come saith the Lord that I will make a new covenant new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah Now, there are those in the Hebrew roots, so-called, I call them antichrists, and they'll say, oh, no, no, it's not a new covenant. It's a renewed covenant. I'm like, huh, what? Well, yeah, you know, he gave us the Ten Commandments and we didn't, and, and the other 613 some odd laws, but we didn't keep them then, but he's going to give us another chance. That's the renewed covenant. Huh? It didn't work the first time, so he's going to do it again? What? Seriously, they believe this garbage. I mean, it didn't work the first time. You know, you know what the definition of insanity is? Is when you do something and it doesn't work, to keep doing it. I mean, really, think about it. You know, it's not a renewed covenant. It's a new covenant, a different one. 
You know, the old one, we couldn't do. It wouldn't, you couldn't do it. You couldn't keep all the laws. You couldn't do it. You break one law one time, that's it. You were guilty of all of them. You know, if you owe a million dollars and you have 900999 uh, $9 and you're a penny short, you can't pay the bill. Even though you got almost, you know, almost all every, you've got ninety nine point nine 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 percent. It doesn't matter. You don't have what it takes. It's not a renewed covenant. It's a new covenant. Of course, they don't even know who Jesus is. Those Hebrew roots devils. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new N E W. Okay? You get a car and it's got 150,000 miles on it. Just because you put new tires on it and give it a paint job, it's not a new car. Oh, but I renewed the paint. And I put new brakes on it and new tires. It's still an old, worn-out car. Oh, but I renewed it. They're idiots. Don't listen to them. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was an husband, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. They broke the covenant, not the Lord. And it says, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the land, in the, I'm sorry, in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. It's not the same, it's not a renewed covenant. It's not the same one. Idiots. Which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. Verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Have you ever met any Hebrew roots people that got the law written in their hearts? No. They got their they want the law written in stone. Oh, we got to keep those 613 laws. Verse 34. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, "Know the Lord," for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. God's not going to remember our sins. Thus saith the Lord, which hath given the sun for a light by day, and the ordinance of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. In other words, as long as there's a sun in the sky, a moon in the stars, 
Israel, the seed of Israel, will never cease from before the Lord from being a nation. That's the Bob translation. Verse 37, Thus saith the Lord, If heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the city shall be built to the Lord from the tower of Hananiel unto the gate of the corner, and the measuring line yet go forth over against it upon the hill Gerub, and shall compass about Goath, and the whole valley of the dead bodies and of the ashes and all the fields unto the brook of Kidron, unto the corner of the horse gate toward the east, shall be holy unto the Lord. It shall not be plucked up nor thrown down any more forever. How long's forever? Forever. In Matthew 15, 24, Jesus speaking, But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The lost sheep of the house of Israel. You know, the people that God divorced? Oh yeah. In the book of Luke, chapter 15, verse 4, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth he not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he have found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Ah, yeah, there's a famous internet preacher in Tempe, Arizona that tells you that repenting has nothing to do with sin, but rather changing your mind about your faith in the Lord. But what, is, what did Jesus say here in verse 7? I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner, sinner, over one sinner that repenteth. He's talking about repenting and sin. That likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. All right, let's go to Joel, the book of Joel, chapter 2. And then we're going to close this out for the Old Testament. And then uh, part three will be, uh, I guess we'll hit the New Testament with part three. You know, I've always heard people, well, you know, the Old Testament, that's for the you-know-whos. And we're not the you-know-whos. And um, the thing is, they'll say, oh, well, that's a book of law and wrath and judgment and all the bad stuff but that's you know they just they don't realize that there's a reconciliation and love and grace read Genesis chapter 6 it says and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord or in the sight of the Lord I I'm paraphrasing but it does say that he Noah found grace there's grace in the old testament it's just the uh, idiots are not looking for it oh it's it's frustrating it really is sometimes i think the whole world's insane and then i look in the mirror and i think is it is it the whole world or is it or is it just me Joel chapter 2 and verse 1, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. 
Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Now, in, um, I think it's in Peter, uh, where it says, a, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. You know, when the Lord says that, uh, you know, something's near at hand, from the Lord's perspective, it's only a day or two, a couple of days. I mean, you know, two or three days. You know, You know, and then people say, well, you know, it's been a couple thousand years. He hasn't returned yet. It sure is, for being a little while, it sure is a long time. You're listening to unsaved people, possibly possessed of devils. What can I tell you? For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh or near at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess. Well, that's to the uh, those that are under the wrath of God. That doesn't pertain to the, the Lord's people. A day of darkness and of gloominess. A day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There hath not ever been... Uh, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains, shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their faces the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness." They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the walls. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march everyone on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. In other words, when they have a battle formation, it's not going to, it's not going to cave in. It's going to be like a wall marching towards you. Verse eight. Neither shall one thrust another, they shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city, they shall run upon the wall, they shall climb up upon the houses, they shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining." Jesus warned about this in the book of Matthew 24 and uh, if memory serves me correctly it's in the book of Revelation as well. Uh, let's see. The sun and the moon shall be dark and the stars shall withdraw their shining and the Lord shall utter his voice before his army for his camp is very great and he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart. Here's the punchline. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. Sorrowful mourning, right? and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Now when God repents, it is different than when we repent. 
Sometimes the Lord intends to do something. For example, he intended to destroy Nineveh, which was the capital of the Assyrian Empire in the days of Jonah. And Jonah got swallowed by the whale, got spit up on the beach, and uh, you know what the god of uh, Nineveh was? Dagon, the fish god. He looked like the Little Mermaid uh, father. You know, Disney's the Little Mermaid. From the waist down, a fish. From the waist up, a man. You know what? When the people that were fishing on the shore, seashore, probably saw Jonah get spit up by a whale, they probably thought, wow, uh, Dagon, our God, hath sent us a prophet. And what did pro Jonah preach? Repentance. And I'm sure these people followed Jonah to the, the capital, Nineveh, and said, man, we saw this guy got spit up out of a, a, a whale. A prophet of Dagon is here. And the people repented. Everybody, from the king to the least of them, they fasted and prayed and put on sackcloth and sat in ashes. And God repented that he was going to overthrow Nineveh. And he repented and he didn't do it at that time. He did later, but not at that time. You know, people, that's what America needs, but it, I, I just don't see it. And I don't claim to be a prophet. So, but when the Lord repents, it's different than when we repent. The Lord is not sinful that he has to repent of evil and wickedness. We do. There's a big difference. In Jeremiah 17.9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And the answer is the Lord. So, turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Verse 14, Jeremiah 2.14. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breasts, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Figuratively, literal, probably both. Let the priest, the minister of the Lord, weep, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they, the heathen, wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. But I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea and his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. 
The fig tree was a symbol of Judah and the vine of Israel. Keep that in mind. Verse 23, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army, my great army, which I send among you. Do you know that there's a, a, a swarm of locusts that's just devouring everything over in the Middle East? Um, I don't know exactly what countries. I think around Afghanistan and Pakistan and around that area, they're just eating everything. There's going to be famine, people. Let me tell you what. There's going to be famine. And the Lord says, My great army which I sent among you. When there's locusts that eat everything that's green, everything, they're the Lord's army that he sent. But there is a, there is a consolation for those that are... Uh, in righteousness and obedience, verse 26. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Read Revelation, people. This is Revelation-type language. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. That's right. Those that call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. And Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. As the Lord hath said, and in the remnant, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Remnant people. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. I don't think it's going to be as many as a lot of people think, but hey, that's just my opinion. What can I tell you? All righty. I'm going to close out this study. We closed out the, um, the Old Testament. Now we're going to, next part three will be the New Testament. I hope to finish it in part three. I don't know if I'll be able to, but I'm going to try. And uh, I'm uh, still... Uh, I'm an ad I was an administrator on Facebook, but um, Facebook locked me out. They banned me. That happens a lot. So I'm, I'm still on my, uh, my ban. So what can I tell you? And I'm still on YouTube. Praise the Lord. He's protecting my channel. Uh, when I'm no longer on YouTube, that's my, that's my cue. Now remember, I'm still on uh, Blogspot. You can read some articles. Not all of them are mine. Some of them are by a guy named Robert Pickle. He had Noahide News, uh, where he warned people about the Noahide laws. Um, I spoke to him on the phone. He put one of my articles on his uh, his website, but I heard somebody told me he recently died. Which is strange because I just wrote him a couple months ago 
And uh, I guess the family took his website down, or maybe they didn't pay the bill, and I don't know. I don't know what happened. I just know that um, his website's gone. I copied some of his stuff that I could and posted it on the blog spot. And um, I'm almost positive he's with Christ. He tried for many years to warn people about the Noahide laws. And um, yeah, you'll never hear the Hebrew roots sacred name people telling you about that. That's for sure. Nope, they're the ones that want to lead you into the Noahide laws. Oh yeah, us Gentiles, we're not Israel. The, the, the Ten Commandments, that's not for us. No, we we got to follow the Noahide laws. Uh, and then ask them, where in the Bible is um, was Noah given these laws? Well, you know, it's not in the Bible, but... But, you know, it, it was one of those oral traditions, you know. If you want to learn about the Noahide laws, you got to read the rabbi. Well, the only rabbi I want to follow is Christ. So, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, Amen. All glory and honor belong to him forever and ever. Amen.